In my last lecture, I talked about post-impressionists. Now I'm going to finish up the 19th century and move into the 20th century with the collection of movements that are sometimes lumped together as fin de siècle, which is just French for end of the century. Symbolism was actually a more important movement in literature and music than in art. Poets such as Baudelaire and composers such as Debussy thought that art should spring from the emotions, from the artist's inner spirit, and that the best guide to that inner spirit came in dreams. Not accidentally, this was also the period when Sigmund Freud began to explore the ways that dreams reveal our hidden fears and desires. So here's a non-required symbolist work, just to give you an idea of this ism. This artist was drawn to fantasy and the macabre, again, the unseen world of the psyche. If you notice that sex is a pervasive theme in these paintings, well, welcome to Unit 12 and the Modern Age. This whole unit should probably get an R rating. Henri Rousseau, another symbolist painter, was a self-taught primitive uh, who was much admired by the avant-garde post-impressionist and expressionist paintings. His paintings are very recognizable for their sharp lines, painstaking details, magical subject matter, and frequent focus on dreams. And speaking of dreams, in this case bad dreams, let's hear from our next presenter. As always, I hope I'm not just repeating what you just heard. Art historians struggle over just where Munch fits into this parade of isms. His swirling lines seem resonant, reminiscent of Van Gogh, especially in Van Gogh's more unbalanced moments. The expressive as opposed to realistic colors also follow post-impressionists such as Gauguin. The dreamscape, for surely this is some kind of bad dream, points to the influence of symbolism. Munk was a Norwegian painter who won a scholarship to study in Paris, where he encountered post-impressionist and symbolist works. He was especially taken with Gauguin, who arguably also fits into both schools. Munk then moved to Germany as expressionism was beginning to grip avant-garde German artists. Stay tuned. As for what was going on in his head, the quote on this slide recounts how Munk himself describes his vision on the bridge. The painting does portray a real place, a favorite local spot for committing suicide, by the way, near an insane asylum for women, supposedly near enough to hear the inmates scream. If you have time, this brief video clip shares some interesting views about this work. The scream was actually part of a series that Munch called the Freeze of Life, paintings that address the central themes of love, sexual anxiety, and death. As you've probably guessed, Munch had a very ambivalent attitude toward women who both intrigued and terrified him. Is a Dr. Freud in the house? And now finally we cross the Great Siècle Divide and move into the 20th century. You've learned about this work over the summer, which seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Let's hear again from one of your classmates. Klimt was a member of the Austrian secessionist movement, so named because these painters seceded from Austria's conservative art movement establishment. Vienna at the turn of the century was the center of cultural ferment and the place where Sigmund Freud was beginning to publish his extraordinarily influential works on the subconscious as revealed in dreams and the sexual impulse that he saw underlying most human actions and feelings. It was a hotbed of anti-Semitism as well and one reason the secessionist painters came under attack is that they often worked for Jewish patrons. If you have time, this video clip will talk about sexual imagery in some of Klimt's other works, more R-rated AP art history, and it also discusses the secessionist movement. And just in case you didn't have time for the video, here's our bloodthirsty pal Judith reincarnated as a sexy femme fatale who lures men to their doom. The model was the wife of a wealthy Jewish businessman. This unit contains surprisingly little sculpture, so I'll flash just a couple of pieces before we get to our required work. I think this wooden low relief panel by Gauguin is a fascinating illustration of the femme fatale we just saw in Symbolist and Fin de siècle painting. Gauguin was influenced by Polynesian sculpture. I've included an example from the Marquesa Islands where he died in 1903. And to the right of that, do you remember, is the Nucorno Micronesian female deity. This sculpture by the artist of our next required work was the work that featured in the U.S. court case that examined the question of what is art for tax purposes. Did art this abstract even count? Brancusi created our required sculpture almost 20 years earlier before he had moved completely into abstract sculpture. Let's hear from still another student presenter. 
Brancusi produced several different versions of this sculpture. Our required work on the right is the last. What evolution do you see in this work? Let's close with this quote from a Romanian sculptor. Does this remind you of any other artists or works? Onward and upward in the 20th century. Up next is Expressionism.